Yeah. Today's sermon title uh, is called Wake Up Call. I will be sharing my testimony from the vantage point of a wake up call. You see, a wake up call is whatever or whatever situation in your life that might not seem as going as planned or sometimes even in a crisis or you know, shaking uh, moment in your life. And the, the Bible is clear that there will be times where God will come in to shake the foundations of your world. And Jesus promised, if anything else, that in this world there will be troubles. But take heart, take heed that God is there. Jesus says, cast your cares upon Him for He cares for you. Um, so this is uh, once again Mr. Kumar. And I thought I wanted to share with you a little bit of at that point in time. Uh, so, you know, how the Ministry of Education actually produced this clip was they kind of invited me, uh, one out of uh, probably tens thousands of uh, stories that uh, had this inspirational element to it in the teaching profession, and they invited me back to school. I'm a, I'm a, I was a motivational speaker. I used to speak at schools and different public platforms. And so they invited me back to my alma mater. And then um, right there and then, because I've not seen my teacher for nearly like 20 over years, and so what happened was that they... They got me to speak, but they hit Mr. Kumar, my form teacher, backstage. And it was a very emotional reunion because at the end of that uh, half an hour, he appeared and I was like, oh, this is my teacher. I didn't know where he was. You know, I thought he was in some old folks' home or something like that, but little did I know that he was still teaching. <laughs> okay, as an adjunct, he's really fit. Anyway, we had a good long talk at the GO, the general office, and he asked me this question at one point in time, and he said, uh, Glenn, out of the thousands of students who have uh, crossed my path, my classrooms, right? What made me stand out in your life? Because I paid tribute to him. And that was how the Ministry of Education actually picked my story. And I said, Mr. Kumar, it was because of your unwavering belief in me. Even before I cleaned up my act, if you knew me back then, I was a rascal. I mean, today I can still be a rascal, but uh, back then I was a real gangster, okay? I know I don't look the part. But... Uh, what happened was that if you remember this part of the clip, he sat me down and he opened that book. Um, in fact, he passed me this book. Uh, how many of you remember what he passed me? What was the book title? Uh, something on public speaking. Can I just tell you now from the horse's mouth, he didn't pass me any book? Okay. <laughs> the producers thought it was a very nice poetic treatment. Uh, it's a symbol of the words he spoke into my life. And uh, it was as if, you know, Glenn, I believe in you. And, and it was on leadership, public speaking, because back then I was a, you know, kind of a gang leader. So he thought, okay, got leadership skill, right? <laughs> so he believed in me. And I still remember uh, he said those words. Those words uh, I, I, I actually gave to the producers and said, you have to put that in. He said those words. He said, uh, you have the power or you have the courage to change your future. So it was a very narrative treatment to this whole story. Um, almost like a narrative theory that we're all stories waiting to be told or unfold. And actually, back in my head, back then, there was a counsellor who was a Christian who spoke into my life as well. There were a few people, including my father, Mr. Kuma, my teacher, and a counsellor. Uh, there were very few people who could speak in, into my life. But back then, these were the people, and I believe God kind of opened those doors of opportunity. And he said this, my counsellor, he said, God is the author of your life. And if you allow him to co-author your next chapter, you know, your life will start to take on new meaning. And it doesn't matter what chapter we all begin on. It doesn't even matter what chapter you're at currently. What's more important is how you write your next chapter. Wouldn't you agree? Amen? And what happens is that at the end of your life, the last final chapter, uh, does it bring God the greatest glory? So it doesn't matter what stage you're at right now. It could be, you know, many of us have struggled through the pandemic. Many of us are even wondering as this year uh, reopens itself with the new norm, post-pandemic, whatever they're calling it. Whatever transition or crossroads, God is in a business and He is wanting to co-author your next chapter. Would you allow Him? Would you allow? So for me, that was a very important milestone in my life um, because after that, uh, my life went downhill. As I told you earlier on, uh, I had 
drop out of school, uh, so I couldn't see him anymore. Um, Mr. Kumar, one of a few who uh, I, I truly respected and admired. And after that, I went down here. I'd like to show you um, uh, my, this is my autobiography. It's called Wake Up Call. And in this autobiography, uh, it tells of a, like I said, my journey from the, from the point of a wake up call. Uh, Romans chapter 13, and inside uh, there's this clock, all right? Romans chapter 13 verse 11 says this, the time is now, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The time is now, the hour has come. So it's not so much about, oh God, we're waiting for you. Uh, we are, uh, we're praying that you begin to do that work that we've been asking, but the hour has come for you. Like right now, God is already waiting for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And when we talk about salvation, I am sure you know that it's more than just being saved, a ticket to heaven. It's His provision, His miracle, His, His blessing, His healing, His wholeness unto your life. It's now. It's here. But how are we posturing ourselves in God's um, timeline? Uh, I have a life verse as well. It's taken from Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. It says this, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. If you, if you know this story, it's about Joseph and his brothers. And this was the tail end of the chapter, the last chapter of Genesis, that he remet his brothers. I, I much prefer, I much prefer this version from the message translation. And it says this: You plan for evil against me, but God used those same plans for good. You see, many times we think that redemption has got to do with, oh, the old hole has gone, the new has come. I know there's baptism coming up. <laughs> and it's true, because God, in, in God, all, He makes all things beautiful, right, in His time. But here, the direct interpretation of this verse here, according to the message, is that God will use those same plans, those same evil designs, in the process of redeeming and making good. He doesn't discard it. And I think it was Pastor Rick Warren who said that there's no experience in life that is wasted in God's eyes, even the bad ones, even the painful ones. He's in the business of repurposing pain. Have you got any struggles and trials and challenges? Well, God is in the business of utilizing that which is evil and bad. And He will use those same plans for good. What a wonderful God. He is in the business of restoration. He's in the business of redemption. Not in a vacuum, but in using your past. So I've got a couple of pictures here that I want to show you. This is my, what Mr. Kumar wrote in my report card book. Uh, back then, it was paper and pen. And in case you can't see it, it says, shows no interest in classwork, always absent from lessons, uh, needs to change his attitude. He's putting it very mildly. I mean, the guy is a very gentle guy. He's very patient with me. No, make no mistake, he's a very firm disciplinarian. But because he believes in his students so much. So he wrote this down. I still remember, you know, I was absent from class and from school, like on weeks on end. If you look at the next slide, these are a stack of what we call white cards that were sent to my parents. You know, back then in those days, if you're absent, absent from school without any reason, the school principal's office was sent these white cards. Years later, my father took out a whole shoebox filled with these cards, threw in my face and said, nah, this is all the trouble they have given us. And I want you to see this one circled here, how uh, I was absent for 20 days or more without permission. I took my own uh, holidays, <laughs> extra. Uh, that was how bad I was. And then um, what happened was that I was already starting to join uh, my friends who were outside. I, I, I was a very um, listless and restless young boy. Uh, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the term ADHD. 
uh, but mine was uh, in the days where you haven't been invented yet. So attention deficit hyperactive is disorder. I was really a rascal in class. Uh, even when teacher was teaching, I was going around disturbing students, uh, my classmates, and I couldn't pay attention, even though I was pretty smart boy, you know, back then. But then because of my behavior and very bad, poor attitude, uh, my grades went down. I hung out with the wrong people. Now, today as a psychologist, I realized there are two key ingredients in youth formation. Parents, you might want to listen to this. Because at the end of the day, it's all rooted in God's design. And these are the two S, a sense of security and a sense of significance. Either which, if you don't have them, you grow out a bit more adaptive, and your sense of well-being and understanding of the worldview is uh, distorted. So a sense of security meaning a sense of belonging and love. We are created to be loved, but love in a context, a social context, because we are social creatures. So how do we understand God's love? Or love from family. At, in the fam God designed a family unit. And that's why we are so big uh, in the Ministry of Social and Family Development in re-establishing the basic building block of society, which is the family. Very, very important. I didn't have that. I didn't know that because home was like a hostile environment. It was like a war zone. I hated to come back home after school because there will be conflicts and of course my bad behavior is just going to trigger off a lot of things from my mother and my father. And so I stayed out late. I hang out with my friends under the void there. And whatever they did because of my my, my uh, deep-rooted insecurity, I would join them. So even in primary school, I mean, they were playing through and shoplifting. I joined them. You know, they were smoking. I started at uh, like P5, P6, and they went for gang clash. I still remember. They went for gang clash, fighting other rival gangs. I also don't know who they are. I also go and join them because I was craving for a sense of acceptance. One of the boys, you know, I was craving for belonging. Deep inside each one of us is that deep need for security. And whenever we feel insecure uh, in our formative years and growing up, we will look for love in all the wrong places. Today as a counsellor, I work with many teens and grown adults, full grown adults still searching. The other is a sense of significance. And significance has got to do with your self-worth. has got to do with your... Um, understanding of your value. You see, I was actually quite a smart kid. I told you that, right? I'm actually quite a smart one, you know. PSLE, not so bad, lah, not so bad. But because my parents, and God bless their hearts, they were well-meaning, but very traditional Asian parenting style. Some of you parents might even identify with it. They always like to compare me with my younger brother, with my, with my, with my cousins. How can they do so well? How can you cannot, how can you cannot measure up? Yeah. And I still remembered in primary five, primary six, I brought back, um, I think it was a mathematics uh, test, and I scored about 92 or 95 per, uh, 93 percent. Parents, 92, 93 percent, good or no good? good. You sure? Yes. Uh, some of you not sure even. Huh? Yeah. But my mother, when I showed it to her, you know what she did? She took that piece of paper and then she said, Why 92 percent only? Why cannot 95%? Because it seems to her, mathematics is the only subject you can score 100%. I, I don't know, parents, I don't know what you're thinking, okay? But 92% also not good enough. Cannot reach, cannot match up to her expectations. The feeling of not good enough. So I wasn't one to take it lightly because I'm not that kind of, oh, emo, you know, i rebellious. At the back of my head, I was thinking to myself, you watch out. Uh, this one cannot, that one cannot, not good enough, not good enough. You watch out. One day, I'm going to go out, I'm going to do all these things, and I'm going to prove to you and show you who I am. It ended in my rebellious uh, behavior, proving, proving, proving to the world. So we call that compensated success, cycle of failure, whatever it is. It is a means of proving because I felt so worthless, so insignificant. And so, when young boys join gangs, usually is this case, you join gangs to prove 
yourself. It is a social construct, this whole identity thing, right? Oh, I got all this gang you know, behind me. But uh, at CMB or at CID, when we break them apart and then interrogate them, oh, they cry like little mouse like that because there's only power in numbers. And these two um, developmental psychosocial tasks, if missing, uh, breeds a certain kind of identity or a certain kind of person that years later will give a lot of problems. The church has an answer, I believe. When and I see young people here, and I saw a, a slogan outside about your church philosophy of uh, reaching out and mentoring youth, it is such a need in these days. Just down the road, MCCY, where we serve in the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth, there is an agenda during these two years of making youth mentoring a pinnacle, a foundational vehicle of reaching and developing the next generation. We know it as discipleship. The young people are crying out, my friends. If you are adult here and you're asking God, God, what should I do in church? It seems that like everything's okay and uh, everybody's well taken care of here. I tell you, there is a lost generation that needs us because we have the answer. We have the answer to the Father heart of God. And there are many spiritual orphans out there. One of my key, uh, I would say, burden these few years has been about the returning of the prodigals. Um, and I'm sure you have heard the Father Heart of God and all that because there are many prodigals out there, just like me, my story, who are re returning back to the doors of the church, to the heart of the Father. The question is, when they return, who will they meet at the door? Who will they meet at your door? The loving Unconditional heart of the father or the elder brother? Oh, you finally come back, huh? <laughs> finally. May God have mercy on us as we learn to exemplify and shine the true unconditional love of the father. Anyway, back to my thing. I didn't have security, a sense of security. I didn't have a sense of significance and it developed this very deviant, very distorted, attitudinal development in me. It did not make me immediately into a criminal. Hello guys, it doesn't work that way. But it set and built the foundation by which my life was to be uh, lived, was to be um, rolled out. So uh, after primary school, I went to secondary school and things uh, just got out of hand. Um, I realized that uh, my group of friends out there were more family than my family, so I stayed out even later because at least they understood where I came from. At least they understood my pain and my frustrations about life. And so I went and hang out with them and very soon music became an interest. And then it became a hobby. And then I pursued it with all my heart because I could identify with the kind of heavy, loud rock music back then. And I still remember bands like uh, I'm not sure whether you're even clued into some of these bands, Guns and Roses and that kind of thing. And, and I was so enamored by the angst behind the lyrics, by their head care attitude. And I said, this would be, because they were singing my anthem, they became the voice to my pain. And so I started to pick up the guitar and play it. And, and, and because I, I, I was quite musically inclined, huh? Uh, even though I was an angry young boy back then, but I played the piano one, you know. And then until I smashed the piano, nothing to play. Lah, huh? then, then I thought, okay, guitar smash still look quite cool because rock, ma, rock attitude. So I grew up like that and uh, I replaced all my homework time uh, playing, eating, sleeping guitar. It became pretty good. We joined bands outside, band competitions. And very soon, once I was kicked out from school, uh, and I went to the homes, I could still continue to write music or at least practice in the studios there. And um, I went for my early enlistment in national service and I became a part-time musician. After that, uh, when I ORD or, you know, um, uh, came out of national service, I was a full-time rock musician and they formed us into bands and brought us overseas because overseas there seemed to be more prospects. And you know what? I, I, I didn't like uh, my family or even Singapore. I said, you know, who needs uh, family? Who needs education? Very anti-establishment, all these rebellious people. So we went overseas and I was living the life because they formed us into groups and we went to play in the clubs, Hard Rock Cafe and all that, toured the Asian circuit. 
and we came back. We had parties, you know. We came back and we had after parties, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., then we slept. My night turned to day, my day turned to night. Now, I told you earlier on, because of this sense of insecurity, I was very drawn to whatever my friends did because I did not have any more moral compass within me. It was really about the toss of the waves around me. Whatever the environment was dictated to me, I would just simply fit in because I didn't want to feel like a misfit. So the chain smoking of cigarettes uh, became alcohol consumption because as a musician, you get free flow of alcohol. And then after that, very s shortly, I was exposed to drugs. And drugs became uh, my downfall. It led to my this race to the bottom. Um, but in Singapore, you know, right, when you are arrested for drug offences, it's a high price to pay. I mean, the drug offences are really severe, the punishment. But once you're overseas, things are different. I still remember when you're overseas, you can get drugs so readily and accessible. Go to the uncle at the copy tell me, hey, uncle, one packet, he had no need to check IC. Um, but, but that's overseas. Now, I have to be very careful who I speak to. In school, I cannot talk like that, yeah, because they will think, oh, okay, he's teaching me how to get drugs. <laughs> But that was, the, that was uh, the reality of it. And I was abusing drugs on a daily basis. Even during my off days, when I could come back to Singapore, I would bring in a few packets of drugs for my own consumption. And very soon, I knew how to make profit through it. So I would bring back larger and larger quantities of drugs with me until one fine day when the law caught up with me. And that was the beginning of my wake-up call. I came back to the causeway because uh, it was in Johor Bahru, it was really easy. And I still remember it was about 3 a.m. past midnight. I took the coach and then we all got to the customs checkpoint at Woodlands to get our passport stamp. And I was just joining the queue. And I still remember there were two customs officers waiting for me at the end of that line. And they stopped me and they said, excuse me, sir, can you please follow us behind back to the body strip search room? Body strip search. All my concealed drugs are uncovered in that moment. You know, today I realized working with the authorities that um, you don't get randomly spot checked like that. <laughs> People set you up. I cannot sabola. So when I was brought behind, I knew that was it because I brought back with me my largest quantity of uh, illegal uh, narcotics drugs with me. Enough to get me the death sentence. I'm standing here before you as a miracle walking testimony. I should not even be alive today, if not for God's hand. And I tell you, every year I reflect with a bit of reverence and trepidation even, because I look back at my case notes. I still keep it, it's all tattered and torn, but my case notes, my offense letters and mitigation, uh, please. It is only a matter of a few more grams. I mean, you put your hand in a pocket, you jingle a few coins, that's the kind of weight we are talking about. A few more coins! That's it. 1995. And you wouldn't even know that I even exist. I would have gotten the death penalty. What's my alternative? Well, if I appeal, if I get my lawyers, if I paid lots of money to mitigate, at best, at best, a life sentence. How long is a life sentence in Singapore? Anywhere from 24, 24 years, 30 years onwards. I would have been an old man coming out. I was 21 years old, guys. And so what happened was, that was the moment of truth that confronted me. I was arrested, red-handed, and I still remember clearly, so vividly, they put me into this interrogation room in Woodlands CMB lockup, and I was sitting there, handcuffed by the chair, and there were two customs officers, uh, the same two jokers. Huh? They were weighing my drugs in front of me on the weighing scale. And that conversation, I tell you, I will still remember till this day. It was as if they were instigating me or something like that. I was behind. I could hear everything. I could, I could see what they were doing. And the conversation went something like that. Hey, hey, I was saying, uh, what you think this guy behind? Uh, you think he can get, 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 get uh, hang or not? Right? They were discussing openly, almost jokingly. And then the other guy would reply, I don't know, la, I don't know what, what the law, everything, but hey, hey, drop, 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 make heavier a bit, make heavier a bit. And I was freaking out, right? Because I was seeing everything and my whole life flashed me by. 
it really was my wake-up call. You know, you ever had that moment where life flashed you by, you ask really poignant stuff about the meaning of your existence, about your purpose, about what is going to be for you, your future. That was what happened to me. Now, I had that one phone call to make. And uh, it's true, you only get that one phone call, five minutes. Who would I call? I had left home, you know, for about three years. No contact with them or literally disowned my family. My parents didn't know where I was. Thank God, I still remember the number and I called up. And um, 3 a.m., my father picked up the phone. Where are you, son? It's been about one, two years. I haven't heard from you. And I told him, broke the news. And he broke down and cried over the phone. If you know my dad, uh, his... his um, He's passed on already, two years already. Thank God for um, our restored relationship and reconciliation. But, but if you know him, he's a very quiet person and he seldom shows any emotion. But he broke down and cried and he said, what have you done with your life, my son? And you know, one foolish mistake, your whole life is gone. The next day, I was sent to be charged in court. And there are a few kinds of charges. Uh, today, of course, I work with the judicial system. Um, you know, you can have the first category of drug possession, consumption. Every week you get people arrested for that. Or the second category, which is really severe, uh, is called trafficking, where you are caught red-handed uh, by an undercover officer. Mine was not the first two. Mine was the most severe. I told you, death or life sentence. Category three is importing of illegal narcotics. Importation! Whenever you are charged or whenever you are arrested at a point uh, of entry into the country, it could be the airport. In my case, it was the Causeway checkpoint. Immediately, you are charged for importation, life or death sentence. No way out. No way out. So, I was charged and my parents came to bail me out. And right there in the courtrooms, I can still remember I was handcuffed. <laughs> my mom knelt down on the floor and she was crying. I've not seen them for a couple of years. And here they were. And um, I still remember that uh, I had a window of four months. That's it. Usually you could kind of delay you know, investigations and stuff like that. Mine was just four months. What was I supposed to, supposed to do within these four months? In a way, when I was in a lockout room the night before, there was a flashback of many, many things. I still remembered, uh, well, besides Mr. Kuma, his words to me, there was this uh, Sunday school song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. I know it's very cliche, but that was the very thing that my heart was yearning all this while. There was this big vacuum within me about, uh, regarding security, significance, proving myself, wanting love, acceptance. Jesus loves me, this I know. How do I know that? Where did I heard that from? In Sunday school. Huh? When, before I walked out from church and God, my father had brought me to Sunday school. He was the only Christian then back then. And so, I, I, I remembered all this and I, I, I felt God's hand tugging me, God word towards himself. You know, in normal days, uh, when things go well, there's really no need of God, right? Huh? Uh, you can watch movie, etc. You're not really frame your mind to look Godward because things are okay. It's a very comfortable zone. But in a crisis, and I know again this is another cliche statement, that's where Christ manifests. All of a sudden, you're desperate. You're searching. And when you seek, you shall find. Friends, when you seek, you shall find. And I wonder how many of us go through a time of struggle. Hey, consider it pure joy because that's the time where God's hand of turning, turning whatever is evil, negative, for bad, He's turning it and making it everything good in His time. So when I was out on bail, what are my alternatives? There were a few choices, there were a few options that ran through my mind. Number one, take my life. Easy, solves problems also, I thought. Number two, run away. Run where? I also don't know. Malaysia, I've got some friends there. 
but I know you can't run too far from the long arm of the law. It was at that point of time where I realized the still small voice of God saying, take responsibility, face the music, because it's only when you entrust your life in my, and I know the Alpha and Omega of all things, the end and the beginning, that I can make it beautiful once again for my glory. So I decided to pray that prayer. Say, God, I mess up all these years. I'm going to take this mess up life of mine and give it to you. You take control. You are the captain of my ship from now on. You come and take over. And I remembered uh, picking up that phone and calling some counsellors and staff that I knew back then in Teen Challenge. Remember, I was there for 18 months, two years, that kind of thing. And I said, I need help. And he said, they said, pack up your stuff, come over for the remaining of your four months. And so that was what I did. That first night that I was in Teen Challenge again, now, by the way, I was, a f I was already an adult, so I, I went to the adult program. There was like a chapel service, uh, almost like this size of a hall, and a pastor was preaching, and at the end, he gave an altar call, an invitation for people to renew, rededicate their lives. I was the first to come up, sobbing right up at the altar call, uh, re-uttering the same prayer, come and take over. Come and take over this mess up life. And for the first time in my life, I could feel like a peace, a love, an infilling of the spirit. Now, my problems didn't just disappear, of course, please. But now there was a newfound hope and inspiration to face whatever consequences. Anyway, it was three months. I had started to turn over a new leaf, attended the daily devotions and Bible class and really poured out my uh, recalibrated my compass. The day came for me to get the sentencing. It was a PTC pre-trial conference. Went to the courts down the road, Supreme Court here. It's very, very uncanny that the Lord brought me back here. Huh? There's all these places. <laughs> and um, I still remembered I, I was there, uh, a little bit of fear, but much more faith. Because my posture had been, you know, if you had already taken over, which you said, I know when I gave you my life, then you will know the results, you will know the consequences of all things. So my job then is just to place my trust in you, whatever the results may be, right? So I was there in a docks. I still remember the judge who was sentencing me took a very long time pouring over the thick files, my case file. I think it was at least a good 15 minutes of silence. He's just flipping through, flipping through. Finally, he put down his spectacles, looked at me, and he said, Glenn, I read through all your appeals. Because the only thing I could do was to appeal. That's all. Uh, send in the interim reports. That's, that's it. My case is, evidence is there, guilty as charged, waiting to be sentenced. And so he put it down and says, uh, this is a tough case. I want to tell you something that I'm going to drop your initial charge of importation, left, uh, life and death sentence, right down to a first-time possession charge. And I want to tell you that I've never done this, nor in the history of the court books in Singapore, I'm going to sentence you a bare minimum of six months. No stroke of the rotan, usually drug cases or stroke of the rotan, okay? Six months! Compared to life, death sentence, six months was like a holiday. I mean, I was so... Happy, I was so joyful. I still remember after they handcuffed me, you know, and, 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 and uh, pronounced the, the judgment, the sentence, I joined a whole queue of prisoners behind, single file loading up into the prison van, and I was the only one smiling. I was so happy, and all the rest of me, Xiao, ah, we're going to prison, why are you so happy? I said, I, I can't wait, you know. It was at least, uh, it was like a, a new lease of life injected in me, so I went to prison a happy man. And, <laughs> The first thing that uh, I, I, the first, you know, when you go to prison, the, the, the many stories even about that. Uh, I just wanted to share with you a few glimpses of that. And uh, let me wrap things up later on with a powerful passage of scripture that's relevant and I hope applicable for each one of you. You know, um, till today, I've always been asking, yeah, 20 over years, right? I've always been asking, Lord, why six months? And it was only recently in the last five years there was some what of an answer. Lord, what's so special? Magic number six, ah? 
Why six months? I mean, you give me six years, I'm not going to complain. Hey, 16 years, I will gladly take it, man. I was supposed to get life or death, you know. Why six months? And finally, after much, uh, you know, internal discourse with the Lord, uh, the Lord revealed something. He said, um, actually, Glenn, you're asking the wrong question. It's not the duration. It's not this surface uh, timeline that I operate on. The right question, Glenn, would have been much better posed as, what is it that I'm doing with this six months? You see, guys, there, there will be some of you who may be going through maybe a dark moment. And it's very easy to say, Oh, Lord, how long more? When will it end? How long more do I need to suffer? Can I gently, lovingly repropose and suggest that the question would be much better um, asked as, Lord, what are you showing me? What are you doing in that time frame? You see, when I went to prison, well, firstly, uh, I saw all my old friends there, okay? Uh, the band boy, la, the druggie, okay, all there, right? So uh, I, I was just saying, hey, four months, I, 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 I turned over, I kind of made new friends with church people and all that. I, I want to leave my old past. That's why sometimes uh, it's not so much about the old has gone and the new has come. <laughs> I'm not going to refute that, but you know, that has got to do with an identity shift and change. But sometimes in the world, which we are all part of, by the way, um, the Lord is doing something with that new identity. So anyway, I met all my old friends, and I was just reflecting, what in the world am I doing here, right? Six months. Uh, and then the Lord spoke to me and said, this is the place of calibration. Keyword, recalibrating my compass, starting with my spiritual compass. And that was the point on from that day that uh, there was no turning back for me. It was, um, I, I, I know many people struggle, especially when it comes to drugs, but I had no problem with that because something shifted at a very deep level, at a spiritual level. I dedicated my life to serve God because this was like a burden to me. Many of us are going through a dark moment. Can I even say, that maybe God is showing you your next stage and even your ministry. My ministry was birthed behind prison bars. As the Lord showed me with empathy through His eyes, the state of this generation. And so I said, I'll give my life to you, God. I will serve you to reach out to this generation. After all, I know uh, and I can identify with the kind of pain that they go through. Well, the next thing for me was, okay, talk so much, you want to serve God, right? But you're here in prison. You are here, and you don't have the qualifications how to help people. There's this naggy voice, huh? Every now and then you say you want to serve God. There's this thing. There's this other part that comes in and, and casts self-doubt. Say, who are you? Who are you to serve God this way? Yeah, what are your qualifications? And it's true. Hello, I was uh, I didn't even finish my end levels. I was a school dropout. But very soon the Lord opened up my eyes. You see, it all starts with that point of recalibration. And I still remember, okay, uh, I want to study to help uh, to be a people helper. I didn't even have the proper words. Uh, was it a counselor, youth worker, whatever, a social worker? Okay, just want to help people. Uh, help people, people helper. And it all started with needing to study again. Uh. So self-study. But then in school, don't want to study. Huh? Uh, give so much problem. Now in prison, you know, you want to study, you know, a, a bit conflicted there. But the Lord opened up um, uh, my eyes to look around and say, okay, what are the resources available? And there's a prison library. There's a prison library. But my time, the prison library was all tattered and torn, like a little storeroom, a few shelves of torn books. And to assess the books, you need to make friends with this um, old uh, prisoner. Uh, he's been there, we call him Lao Jiao, right? He's been there for many, many years. Um, and he's probably going to retire in prison as well. Every morning, he takes a dim sum card, he puts some books and magazines, and he will shout, uh, books, books, along the corridor. And if you want, you can say, hey, uncle, uncle, can I, you know, can you throw in some books to myself, right? 
So I did that. And I said, Uncle, Uncle, I want to study. Uh. I want to self-study, okay? Can you throw in some books uh, for me? He threw in a magazine. It was FHM, okay? <laughs> All the girly photos. I said, you don't understand, Uncle. I want to study. <laughs> so the next day, he threw in a little book, Tatted and Torn. It was by Shakespeare. <laughs> Twelve night. And I opened the book. I was so hungry, I sat in a corner, flip. I have not studied for more than three, I mean, what, five years already. I opened a book, and then it goes like a, do thou do us, art thou, well thou. I, forgot, I was looking at see me. I don't even understand. Uncle, uncle, can you please uh, uh, pass me a dictionary? And so that was the beginning of my self-study program. When I got out of prison, I went back to Teen Challenge. The Lord led me back there. Uh, and then I started enrolling myself to different causes in people helping, in youth work, in counselling. And um, fast forward to today, I, I went back on my track. Now studying was like a newfound passion. You know, last time I didn't want to study. But because I found my purpose, this was easy. I retook my uh, N-level, O-level, went on to do a poly, you know, pre-grad, post-grad. Uh, after that, I uh, got myself certified in many things. I went on to do my degree, went on to do two masters, and today I'm on my PhD, yeah, uh, scholarship. And I just want to share this with you, not because to boast, but, you know, when you are in line and in step with God's purposes for you, you're walking in destiny, in a calling, there's that sweet spot in you, no matter what's happening around you, COVID, no COVID, yeah, inflation, you know you're in the right place at the right time. And God is resourcing, He's redeeming, and He is positioning you for such a time. I just, uh, just want to flip through uh, the rest of the slides. Not sure whether this is still working, but just, you know, just help me out. The next few slides, these are photos um, of uh, me just being released, went back to Teen Challenge. I cut my teeth there in sharing my testimony. You know, I, I, back then I couldn't even share to five, six people in a small room. I was always in fear. The Lord gave me the voice. And then, you know, He helped me to gain the skills in public speaking. Uh, today, of course, um, I, I run a training company. I'm training other speakers and coaches and trainers as well. Uh, and then over the years, I've won a couple of awards. I've been um, uh, featured. And not only that, I've been working with different ministries, uh, particularly Ministry of Education, MCCY, and also MHA Home Affairs because of the prison uh, systems. And I'm a curriculum, curriculum developer there. And um, my greatest joy uh, and the way the Lord has uh, opened up doors for me is, is really to speak with people, to be a voice piece, to be an ambassador. And over the years, I had a great privilege of speaking uh, regionally to many people as well, bringing the redemptive grace and promises of God to everyone through my professional commercial work. I want to end off with this passage, yeah, Exodus chapter 8. And this is where I want to land. Um, there's a very interesting passage, as you know, in Exodus. Uh, we're talking about the ten plagues and how God used Moses, Aaron, to lead the Israelites out of the clutches of Pharaoh of Egypt, where they were in bondage and they were slaves. In many ways, I relate to them. Um, and there are so many permutations to the kind of picture and context by which it's painted. One, of course, is uh, you know God may lead us out and deliver us out of our bondages, but it's not enough to just stay there and wander in the desert. It's another thing to, to possess the land, right? That is our calling. That's our destiny, not just to be saved. That's not the end point. The key thing is to enter the land. What land has God given to you? Anyway, if you backtrack to this, in Exodus 8, this is the second plague of the, uh, that uh, God pronounced on Egypt. It's called the plague of the frogs. Ten verses, very telling of how God is using us and the situations around us to call us back unto Himself and His purposes. Can we just read from verse 1 very quickly? The Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Let my people go so that they may worship me. And if you refuse to let them go, I will plague your whole country with frogs. 
the river now will team with frogs. They will come up into your palace, your bedroom, and your bed, into the houses of your people, into your ovens and kneading troughs. I want you to picture this. It's a very vivid mental picture. Frogs everywhere, carpeted green, in your house, on your bed, in the kitchens, you're eating frog mee goreng and uh, prata or whatever, right? It's frogs everywhere. And then, of course, Pharaoh refused. So verse 5, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your stuff over the streams and make frogs come out on the land of Egypt. And so frogs came up and covered the land. And verse 7, But the magicians in King Pharaoh's court also did the same things by their secret arts. They also make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Now this, I don't quite get it. As if there were not enough frogs. Okay, the uh, magician said, we also can. <laughs> so now you've got more frogs covering up the land, right? Verse 8, Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away and I will let your people go. Please, I had enough. And what did Moses say? Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your people that you may be rid of the frogs. Now, I want you to really focus and pay attention to this. I leave you the honor of setting the time and the date. You want to get rid of the frogs like right now? Tell me. It will be done. Snap out a finger. Pray. Gone. What did Pharaoh reply? Verse 10. Pharaoh said, tomorrow! <laughs> this is the stupidest answer in the Bible. Right then and then, the frogs could have been gotten rid of, like then and then, right? Right that moment. But Pharaoh said, one more night with the frogs. <laughs> tomorrow can lah. In essence, Pharaoh hasn't woken up yet. And you and I laugh, but uh, for many of us, in whatever situation we're at, we tend to be like Pharaoh. The Lord is placing His finger in our hearts. Whatever that frog may be symbolizing in your life, it could be uh, uncleanness, sin, whatever it is. It could be your procrastination of obeying, of stepping out in faith. It could be complacency. It could be a comfort zone that you're just refusing to take a step out. It could be passivity. The Lord is saying today, today is the day. Now is the time to deal. Don't wait. Don't wait until the next uh, wave post-pandemic. Now is the time. The waiting game is over. Step into your destiny. Step into that calling. What have you been procrastinating? What have you said? You know, wait lah. Wait until the next. Wait until things are better. Wait and see. The Lord wants to work in us today. Can I ask the worship team to just step up? And I just want to close this. And I feel I, feel I need to, to take a, another step in this church. And I think I can do it because I'm the guest speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're too, too familiar, lah, huh? but I can. And, and allow me, please, because I'm just an instrument of God's challenge to you. Yeah? Um, as we close with this song, can, can I ask all of us to just stand, prepare our hearts to worship God, to come back or to come near to Him. I, I, I want to end with this, uh, it's not an analogy, it's a real story. I mean, one of my favorite authors is... Um, C.S. Lewis, and I think he's got this journal, an article about, um, he chronicles the, 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 the discussions of uh, Satan and his demons. And, and there's one story that says, you know, uh, Satan called his demons together and said, you know, come on guys, uh, let's brainstorm. How we, uh, what ideas can we have to go up there to deceive mankind? And demon number one put out his hands and said, you know, uh, Let's go up there and tell them that uh, God doesn't exist. And Satan looked at him, you silly demon. Uh, you look around and uh, the Bible says that all of God's creation reflects His glory. Of course, they're going to find out sooner or later there is a God. 
Demon number two raised up his hands. Okay, let's go up there. Tell man there is God, but God doesn't love them. And then Satan said, You silly demon. The Bible says that uh, God's love compels, draws them towards himself. Sooner or later, they're going to find out that God loves them. Finally, demon number three raised up his hands. He said, Okay, I've got this great idea. Let's go up there. Tell them that God exists, God loves them. But there's still time. And Satan said, great idea. There's still time. Let's close our eyes.